Hi everyone, welcome back to Neurobiology at Providence College. I'm Joe DeGeorges. Today's lecture is part two of our conversation on chemical signaling in the brain based on a Scientific American paper written by Jean-Pierre Shengzhou. It was written in 1993. In this publication, Shengzhou outlined how he biochemically purified the acetylcholine receptor and characterized its function. He was trying to figure out how the acetylcholine receptor works. We said that he started his experiments with tissue from the electric organ of electric fish, like the torpedo ray, and it was known that this tissue was highly abundant in the acetylcholine receptor, so it made it a very good tissue for this biochemical purification. He took the tissue and then homogenized the sample, that is, he made a milkshake of the tissue, so in a buffer solution, and the homogenization step breaks up the cells and liberates various components, and we said that membrane fragments derived from breaking up the plasma membrane of the cells tends to come back upon itself to form smaller membrane-bound structures that they called microsacs. So sort of like small, smaller basketball. They start out with a large cell with a lipid bilayer, and if you fragment this lipid bilayer, then it comes back upon itself to form a smaller basketball, and the shell of the basketball is synonymous with the lipid membrane. And there's an aqueous component here, an aqueous component outside of the microsacs and the cell itself. And it turns out that you can then biochemically purify the microsacs through differential centrifugation. So you take a test tube and you add various concentrations of sucrose. It's a sucrose density gradient, so it separates things based on their density. And we said that you could, for example, have a 50% sucrose layer, a 20% sucrose, a 10% sucrose made in a buffer solution. But basically, it's just three different concentrations of sugar water made up in a buffer. And if you load the homogenate onto the top and then spin it at high speed, components separate out based on their density. So some things end up in the bottom of this test tube here. Some components will float on top of the 50% layer, but be within the 20% layer. And the microsacs would lie here in the 10% layer, floating on the surface of the 20% layer. And then things that were soluble would be found in the supernatant. And we said that you could easily draw off these microsacs by putting a syringe, poking a needle through the plastic of the test tube and drawing the microsacs off. It would just suck these up when you pull. You have to have the bevel of the needle facing up, and then when you draw the liquid in, it pulls off this layer of the microsac. So you could also pipette off the top supernatant and put it in a test tube and then reach down a little bit deeper for the microsacs. But this syringe technique is very quick and easy, and now you have a sample of microsacs. Pieces of the cell membrane that came back upon itself because the lipid is hydrophobic. And we said, Sheng Zhu said, that if you ground up this material like this in the presence of radioactive ions like potassium or sodium, radioactive sodium, let's say, you could measure the radioactivity of the group of microsacs that have 
different amounts of sodium, radioactive sodium and potassium in them. And then you could add acetylcholine. And acetylcholine then induced the radioactive ions to run down their concentration gradient, in this case, to the outside of the microsacs. And then if you repurified the microsacs, you could get rid of the radioactivity. That is, you, you draw the microsacs off here and have them here with loaded with radioactive sodium and potassium channels. And then if you purify these again over the gradient, one, two, three layers, so they are going to be here uh, in the 10% layer on top of the floating on top of the 20% layer, that these, once these released the radioactivity, when you spin that over the sucrose density gradient, the radioactivity is soluble and it would remain in the supernatant. And now the microsacs would be below that radioactivity in this layer. So now if you draw these off with the syringe and you measure the radioactivity of these, it's much less than the radioactivity in this particular sample. And that demonstrated that the membranes must contain the acetylcholine receptor because they're, they're responding to the addition of acetylcholine, and that the pore that allows the radioactive ions to pass out through the membrane must also be present in the membrane itself. So whatever is in the membrane, whatever the receptor's composition is, it does two things. It, it binds to acetylcholine, or maybe more correctly, acetylcholine binds to it. It binds to the receptor, and the receptor somehow opens and allows the radioactivity, the radioactive ions, to flow from inside to the outside of the microsacs. So that was good news. So this process of biochemically purifying the microsacs was a beginning stage for the biochemical purification of the acetylcholine receptor. So Sheng Zhu has a very simple technique to biochemically purify microsacs from the electrocytes, the electric cells of the electric tissue of electrofish. And we said that when you fragment the cells, that the membrane fragments come back to reform smaller spheres that they call microsacs. And the microsacs were shown to contain the acetylcholine receptor based on the radioactive experiments by Shang Zhu. And the receptor, or what's present on these microsacs, in these microsacs, is both the part of the receptor that binds to acetylcholine and also the pore or the channel that allows ions to flow through the membrane and down their concentration gradient. But we know that if you take a look at a cell with its cell membrane, that there are many different components associated with the cell. You could have proteins that have transmembrane domains that span from the inside to the outside of the membrane. You could have proteins and other substances that are outside of the cell, but attached to the cell membrane or inside the cell and attached to the membrane. And of course, you could have cytoplasmic components like the nucleus, like the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus and so on and cytoplasm and the contents of the cytoplasm. So when you grind up these cells and you form the microsacs, there are still many proteins that were derived from this cell present in the microsac itself. Now first, of course, he showed that the acetylcholine receptor is still in the microsacs. But you could have other proteins, and indeed they do have other proteins, and other compounds that are associated with the membrane, and things that could have been trapped inside when this fragment was broken up 
then the micro sac was formed. So this is a partial purification of the acetylcholine receptor, but they had to take further steps to totally purify the protein. Now, they know that the acetylcholine receptor also is triggered by nicotine, which is an agonist. Nicotine and acetylcholine both bind to the acetylcholine receptor and induce the flow of ions across the cell membrane. Curare competed for the site and blocked acetylcholine receptor activity and ultimately causes an organism to die of asphyxiation because the diaphragm of the organism can no longer contract. I mean, it paralyzes the muscle and the organism dies of asphyxiation. It turns out that along with curare, a second toxin from snake venom, alpha bungarotoxin, also bind to the acetylcholine receptor. And Shang Zhu used this toxin to further purify the receptor itself. So now if you take this test tube full of microsacs here and you add detergent which breaks up membranes, now you have individual proteins and lipids in this detergent treated sample and they use an affinity chromatography technique where they take a long tube like this and they block this, they put a piece of filter material here which will, will allow liquids to flow through and individual proteins and so on but then they use glass beads and the beads were conjugated, that is bound to, alpha bungarotoxin, the snake venom, or the snake venom was bound to the glass beads. So we have this column now filled with glass beads with snake venom attached to the surface. Now if we pour this new detergent solubilized fraction over the top of the column, and we drip what comes through into a test tube, then what happens is that the acetylcholine receptors here, now free in solution, bind to the alpha bungarotoxin. So you have the toxin, and now you have the receptors binding to these glass beads because the bungarotoxin has a high affinity for the acetylcholine receptors. So the receptors now bind to the glass beads. Now you can wash with buffer all of the other components of this homogenate, all of the cellular material here, all of these proteins that are now liberated from the microsacs because of the detergent. And all of that flows through into this test tube that we then throw away. And all we have left now are beads with alpha bungarotoxin attached to the acetylcholine receptor. So it's an affinity chromatography technique. Then Sheng Zhu just adds curare, which we all know also binds to the receptor and it outcompetes the alpha bungarotoxin for the receptor site. And now the receptors come off of the alpha bungarotoxin, off of the bead, bound to curare, and the curare and the receptor bound together fall through the column into a new test tube.
So now we have a test tube filled with acetylcholine receptors like this bound to curare. So I'm going to draw it like that. So this is the receptor and then this round little dot is the curare. And, and Shengzhu wants to get rid of the curare. So he puts it in a bag that's sealed off and we have the receptors and the curare like this. Now the bag is a membrane that has holes in it and the holes are big enough for the curare to fit through but not the receptors. I mean maybe I should draw the receptors a little bigger like this. And there is a kinetic action between these two molecules. So this is in liquid and the whole thing is in a beaker of buffer like this. Okay, so there's liquid and it's floating in the liquid. Now it turns out that there's an on-off rate that the receptor releases the curare and then oftentimes it can come back and bind to the receptor again. It's kinetic. It's not a permanent association between these two molecules, the protein and the curare. So it's just an on and off. And sometimes when it, the curare is off, it runs down its concentration gradient through holes in the membrane. And so now the curare is out here in the liquid. And once it comes to equilibrium, then there will be curare on either side of the membrane. But then if you just pour out the water or the buffer here and you add new buffer, you keep washing it until you have your bag with only receptors in the bag. So this is dialysis tubing and you end up with just the receptor with no curare. Now you have highly purified receptor molecules, acetylcholine receptor molecules, and the question is whether these receptors that you've purified contain everything that's needed to bind acetylcholine and to allow ions to pass through the lipid bilayer. So they can add this to lipid and create fake cells that have lipid and then this receptor. And once again, when they make these, they can make them such that they incorporate radioactive potassium and sodium ions, just like Shengzhu did with the microsacs. And now if you add, if you have these purified or these generated small cells that contain the receptor, if you add acetylcholine, can you get the radioactivity to move from the outside of these generated mini cells? And indeed, they could get that to happen. So whatever it was that they purified through this process was indeed everything needed to do two things. One, to bind to acetylcholine, and secondly, to allow the ions to flow through the membrane. They then decided to look at the structure of these receptors. And when they did that, they realized that it looks like a flower, a rosette. And there are one, two, three, four, five petals to the flower, and then a dimple in the middle. 
And that suggested to them that the dimple could be the pore that allows the ions from the inside to the outside of the cell. Now that they have the receptor purified, so we have just receptors like this, then they can try to analyze this protein a little bit. I mean, they studied the structure in the electron microscope to find the shape of the rosette, and they decided to run a protein gel. Now, in protein gels, if you have more than one protein that makes up a complex like a receptor, then the individual proteins come apart. You add chemicals that break disulfide bonds and other interactions between proteins. And so when you run them on a gel, it's like a like PCR, running out of PCR gel, but proteins are a little different. They run through acrylamide rather than agar. But just like DNA and RNA gels, the Proteins, in this case of a protein gel, run along the gel based on their molecular weight, mostly in a tiny bit based on charge, but the smaller proteins run faster and the bigger proteins run slower because it's harder for the bigger proteins to make it through the matrix of the gel. And it turns out that when they run the acetylcholine receptor on the gel, they find four bands, four different proteins. Like this. Four different bands. But they noticed that this band is thicker than this band, this band, or this band. And that suggested to them that the rosette which contained five petals might contain two copies of this and one copy, one copy, and one copy of these three other bands. So you have two, three, four, five proteins that come together to form one molecule. And of course, this represents thousands of molecules, but thousands of copies of each of these bands and twice as many in this particular band that's that's visible by stain. You have to stain the gel. So they decided to call this one the alpha and then my guess and, and then of course they have a beta, a gamma, and a delta. I mean A, B, C, D just as an informal name for these different components and they think that there are two alpha subunits, a beta, a gamma, and a delta subunit that make up a functional receptor. Now, they could further analyze these bands by taking a razor blade and cutting these bands out of the gel. So again, a band is one type of protein, so a string of amino acids, and just many, many copies of that. So they're all the same molecular weight, so they all run at the same um, speed in the gel. And, um, and then the alpha band. And they subject them to amino acid sequencing, in this case, Edmund degradation, which gives you sequences along the end terminal of the proteins. The protein has the end terminal and the carboxy terminal, and you can sequence the amino acids from the end terminal and derive a short stretch of amino acids from, let's say, the alpha 
and then the beta, the gamma, and the delta, and so on. So they were able to take these purified proteins from the receptors, determine that there are four unique proteins, and they come together in a two to one to one to one stoichiometry to form this rosette with the dimple in the middle, which is likely, they suspected, to be the channel where the ions pass. Later, they were able to figure out that the acetylcholine receptor binds to the two alpha subunits, and that opens the hole in the middle, and then the ions flow through. Um, in the case of the radioactivity, from the inside to the outside of the cell, but in terms of acetylcholine and how the neurotransmitter affects the muscle cell at the neuromuscular junction, the acetylcholine binds to the receptor and it opens the channel and allows positive ions inside the cell, making the downstream cell less polar, so it depolarizes the cell and causes muscle contraction in the case of the muscle or an action potential in a downstream neuron. Over time, they were able to sequence the amino acid sequence of each of these four proteins. So now they have the amino acid sequence. So the string of amino acids that make up each of these four proteins and they believe that one copy of this protein, one copy of this protein, one copy of this protein, and two copies of the alpha subunit come together to form one mature acetylcholine receptor. And it turns out that if you know the amino acid sequence, you can do some analysis. And one analysis showed that all four of these proteins were highly similar to one another. What this means is that the four genes that derive these proteins share a common ancestral gene. And I'll explain more about that later in the semester. But these form a family of proteins that are all extremely similar to one another. And it turns out another analysis revealed that for each of these proteins, there were four hydrophobic regions of about 20 amino acids in length. And those denote a region that spans the plasma membrane, transmembrane domains. So there were four for each of these proteins. Okay, so these regions here are about 20 amino acids that are hydrophobic, that don't like to be exposed to water. And so those regions hide within the cell membrane. Let me finish my diagram here. Which means if we have our lipid bilayer, so here's our phospholipid heads in our tails like this, and our phospholipid heads here with our tails, that the alpha subunit, one of the alpha subunits, the protein is on the outside of the cell and then goes to the inside of the cell, passes back out, in, out. One, two, three, four transmembrane domains in the alpha subunit. So each of these proteins, two copies of the alpha subunit, beta, one copy of beta, gamma, and delta, all span the membrane four times, and they all come together to form this shape of the rosette. And the, the acetylcholine receptor binds to the two copies of the alpha subunit, 
and opens this pore in the middle, which in this case allows positive ions into the muscle cell, causing it to contract. Okay, finally, as time went on, scientists found not just one type of the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta subunits in the brain, but many types. And what that suggested is that there's a wide variety of receptors that respond to different neurotransmitters and have different effects on the cell that possesses them.